Hello, good morning, <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our webinar. Uh, the webinar is on the possible impact of uh, COVID-19 on the economy. So uh, really the hot topic right now, uh, which I believe uh, you, you follow not only in terms of the possible uh, economic uh, developments and, and the economic impact, but uh, <clears throat> also on, on daily cases of that, what, what we heard, what is reported by particular countries. Uh, so thank you that you joined uh, this morning our webinar. My name is Grzegorz Sielewicz. I'm a COFAST economist uh, covering Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, and let's start uh, very technically. Uh, so uh, if I, will, I just wanted to let you know what's the agenda of our meeting today. So first I will start with uh, the presentation. Uh, and then after roughly 30, 20, 30 minutes of, of my presentation, there will be the Q&A session. You are encouraged to ask your questions. Um, this presentation, uh, this, this session is recorded. Uh, you will be able to, to download the, the recording if you need for your further needs or you would like to share it with your colleagues. Uh, and also this presentation, you can uh, immediately download it uh, because it's uh, in the hands out section uh, you have in this webinar toolbar on the right hand side of, uh, of, of your screen. Uh, you can you can uh, take a look at the hands out section and there's a webinar uh, which uh, you can uh, download. Uh, so uh, in terms of um, impact, economical impact, uh, well, I will start uh, <clears throat> I will start with uh, not those what's happening actually uh, in the economy, but uh, from uh, this what we have, what what the number of cases is, uh, and uh, as you can see, I. Uh, updated these charts, those charts with cases of um, coronavirus worldwide um, last week. Uh, and uh, we've seen that already at that time we had 120,000 20, cases of coronavirus worldwide. Uh, you can see from the left hand side uh, that the number of that uh, was increasing. Unfortunately, it was increasing. And although this chart was updated last week, Today I checked the recent data and we have nearly uh, 200,000 cases. So even uh, in last days, uh, I think that last three days were, were quite crucial with additional 35,000 cases of, cases of coronavirus worldwide. Uh, so it uh, has been reported by 155 countries. Uh, so indeed, uh, it comes with no surprise that the World Health Organization uh, defined uh, this disease COVID-19 as a as a pandemic. Uh, so hopefully, as you can see, the on the left hand side, this green part of the chart uh, is is going up. So the recovered people, but nevertheless, uh, we we have reports of deaths as, as well as uh, this a huge uh, economical impact coming from the COVID-19. Uh, so, of course, first uh, COVID-19 started in Asia, in China, <clears throat> but what's uh, more and more important for us in Central and Eastern Europe, in, in Europe in general, uh, that is <clears throat> right now more uh, the significant issue for, for Europe. Also, it's coming a very significant issue for, for the US. So, as you can see from the chart on the right hand side, whereas uh, new confirmed cases mostly previously were uh, that one's from, from China. Right now, the uh, situation in China is much more calmer. Uh, and and uh, we see that uh, in other regions, so as I mentioned, Europe, also the US, uh, those, those regions report uh, increasing number of, uh, of cases. Uh, so I think to <clears throat> catch uh, the uh, possible economic impact of COVID-19 to, to economies, to, to the global economy, uh, and uh, more to that, to mostly uh, to, to Central and Eastern European economies, because I believe that's uh, that's very important for you, for for particular countries uh, in uh, our region. I think we have to conclude what are channels of contagion. Uh, and well, I will start uh, with that. What it has started. So with China, uh, it started with China in in the province of Hubei. Uh, the city of Wuhan, as you know, uh, that was uh, where the biggest number of cases uh, was was reported. Uh, and uh, well, indeed, in terms of China, as I said, the uh, situation uh, started to be uh, calming down. Uh, already China started to 
uh, ease uh, those quarantine measures and then those, um, uh, I would say, very drastic measures that were implemented. Uh, right now we have a situation that, for example, Apple company opened uh, uh, its uh, stores uh, in China, uh, whereas it closed in uh, Europe. Uh, so, so indeed, uh, this COVID-19 uh, pandemic is, is, is moving, uh, as, as it was already <clears throat> said. So, in terms of China, we already expected a slowdown of the economy previously, uh, because there are issues like trade wars, like structural issues of the Chinese economy. Uh, but previously, our uh, growth forecast for the Chinese economy was 5.8%. Uh, as you can see from this chart, uh, we expect uh, that um, GDP growth in China uh, will suffer from the huge uh, contraction uh, in, in Q1. Uh, the question is that how long it will take, uh, because we, we are still not sure. Although I said um, slowly the activity is coming back uh, in China, but nevertheless, uh, it's, it's quite slow. The question is that it will be really a V recovery, uh, so-called uh, V recovery by economists. So, so um, when you have um, a drop of the activity, but then you have a strong rebound. Uh, so that's our baseline scenario. Our risk scenario is that it will take a quarter longer. Uh, but nevertheless, after that, as you can see, still China will be will be slowing down. Uh, and if we take a look at <clears throat> what's um, uh, particularly happening in China, and I think it could be also a lesson uh, for, for us in Europe, uh, what, what, uh, what was impacted there in China, where you can see that on the right-hand side chart, um, this is, those are PMI indicators, so Purchasing Managers Index. If you are not familiar with that, uh, those are indexes uh, done separately for manufacturing and for services. Uh, those ones uh, you can see on the right hand side are on manufacturing. Uh, and uh, many questions are asked companies about the level of production, about uh, the level of employment, what, what they expect uh, in the near future. Uh, and the aggregate index uh, is produced as a, as a figure. It is considered that if it is above 50, uh, it is uh, a recovery of manufacturing. If it is below 50, it is a slowdown. Uh, so as you can see already in terms of um, those both PMI indicators, so CAIXIN and uh, NBS, uh, NBS, so National Bureau of Statistics in China, it's the official figure. Uh, both of them were quite pessimistic already before this uh, coronavirus effect happened. Uh, but uh, recently published data for February are, uh, were a very harmful drop, very, very deep drop of, of the activity in China. Uh, as uh, you can see, uh, because those lines are, are like following each other, so I don't know if this chart is clear, but nevertheless, uh, in terms of PMIs, uh, the scale is on the left-hand side. So uh, you can see that uh, NBS manufacturing PMI dropped to uh, the level of 37 points. That's the lowest level in the whole history. Those, um, those uh, surveys started, uh, as far as I remember, 1999. And since then, we have not had such a, a significant drop. Even when we had the financial crisis 2008, uh, beginning of 2009, at that time, uh, the lowest point for China was uh, 39 points. So now you can see that that's, it's even deeper, but it, also, it is, of course, uh, the sentiment indicator. Uh, among other indicators that were uh, released uh, by China, we have auto sales so far, and the drop here with the right hand scale is also very deep. 80% year over year drop, 8-0. So a significant drop of, of car sales. It comes with no surprise uh, when people stayed home, when they were afraid if the uh, coronavirus would, would not affect them. Of course, they was, uh, spent only money for, for um, daily necessities for that's what's, what's necessary not for durable goods. Uh, and on the left-hand side, you can see a chart which looks still uh, quite optimistic because uh, those it finishes at December uh, 2019 with industrial production and retail sales in China. Um, nevertheless, um, uh, at, on Monday, uh, there were released data. I have not included in this chart because they were uh, data for, for those indicators were uh, so far released for January and February. 
Uh, it's a, a kind of exception each year uh, in China because after the New Year holidays period, they release um, the first data for January and February. So it could be comparable. It, it couldn't be comparable with those data you can see on the chart, but nevertheless, I will mention that. And here with those hard data, we also see uh, a drop of the activity. Uh, well, um, I use some extrapolation and we use some extrapolation here. And in terms of industrial production, according to our calculations, industrial production in China dropped by 33% year over year. In retail sales, the drop was even more significant, 48%. So it gives us some view what uh, the contagion effects, what adverse effect of uh, this pandemic uh, could have on the economy and what quarantine measures with uh, people staying at, com uh, at home could have on retail sales. Uh, I think it's uh, nowadays it's a, it's a very important lesson uh, for us in Europe. Uh, of course, why do I say so? Why do I talk to so much about China? Uh, one of that reason I mentioned to you it's, it's of course because uh, the COVID-19 started there. But the second issue is that uh, China is a significant player right now globally. Uh, well, uh, when we compared 2002-2003, those were years when we had the SARS episode, uh, another epidemic that that was uh, that was in in Asia, uh, mostly in Asia. Uh, well, that that was the reason that it was first. It was mostly in Asia, and the second reason is that China right now is is a much more important economy also uh, in, in terms of of uh, global development. So. A contribution of China to global GDP and to global trade is much higher right now. So if China suffers, then uh, it's very likely that the global economy will suffer. Also, in terms of investments coming from China and the number of tourists, which is partly a reason why we uh, quite fast um, uh, have uh, those uh, COVID-19 cases in Europe and also other, other countries, uh, not only uh, in Asia. And then I think we can move. Sorry, we can move to uh, the second channel of contagion for for Europe, uh, and uh, this this second channel is uh, that what could happen with uh, trade uh, with with China. So first of all, exports exports are not very significant part of uh, exports of Central and Eastern European economies. Uh, maybe um, just it's worth to mention Russia uh, because Russia is also in in our uh, sea region in our business split. Uh, so Russia is uh, exposed the most because uh, it uh, exports to China 12% of of its uh, to total exports, whereas uh, imports are 22%. So so this dependence uh, is uh, is quite significant. Actually, it's the biggest single, if we take a look at single country uh, in terms of Russia. Uh, in terms of other countries, uh, the Chinese market, as I said, for C countries is not very important uh, for Bulgaria, for Slovakia. Uh, we have um, um, the equivalent of exports slightly exceeding 1% of GDP in terms of other countries is below 1% of GDP. But of course, China is a very significant supplier of uh, of, of various uh, products, various merchandise, and also intermediate goods. Uh, and here, of course, uh, the, the um, uh, possible supply shock would be a hard hit also for, for Central and Eastern Europe, but not only, also, of course, for, uh, for other economies. Here on this chart, you can see um, supply chain disruption, disruptions, possible supply chain disruptions that could suffer from uh, from the supply shock in China. Uh, and here just a word because I mentioned that, uh, well, uh, the, in China we have um, uh, a slight improvement, maybe would not be a right word, but, but nevertheless the quarantine measures have been eased. Uh, as, as I mentioned, the example of Apple, which, which started to open its stores in China, uh, it seems that uh, the peak uh, has been already reached in China. Actually, that's also another scenario that the peak of COVID-19 cases in China was in, was in February this year. But nevertheless, we see, and it's shared by our Asian colleagues, by our Asian economists, uh, that we could have the second round of, of cases in China of, of COVID-19. 
uh, as because uh, those uh, quarantine uh, measures have been eased, because there are um, uh, still, although there are some travel bans, uh, still um, COVID-19 could come back to, to, to China. And still, I think we should be aware that the risk of supply shock may be diminished, but it is still there. So uh, here on this chart, you have downstream and upstream um, segments in supply chains, in possible supply chains. Uh, and uh, well, downstream is that imports of intermediate goods from China. So, so uh, what, what's the percentage um, of imports, intermediate goods imports from China in, in total imports of intermediate goods of particular country? In terms of the up, upstream upstream segment, uh, it's this is this green part of these bars, uh, and uh, well, here those are exports, intermediate exports of goods to China as a percentage of of uh, total uh, gross exports of intermediate goods. Uh, so as you can see, <clears throat> the most exposed countries, uh, I think it is no surprise, are Asian countries. <coughs> Sorry, uh, and uh, not only Asian countries but also Latin America countries. So. Uh, here, uh, maybe coming more to <coughs> sorry, <coughs> coming uh, more to to this uh, downstream segment. So, uh, what uh, what is the share of all intermediate products imported from China? Uh, here, this picture is is roughly very similar to that what what was uh, showed in a previous slide. So, Asian countries, Latin America countries, uh, but also in our region, Russia. Uh, th those countries, uh, for, for those countries, China is a, a significant uh, supply of intermediate uh, goods. Uh, going further to Central and Eastern Europe, you can see that on uh, the right hand side uh, that uh, indeed Russia's shares is the biggest, but we have also countries like Poland, like Czechia, Estonia or Slovakia. Uh, when we can see that uh, uh, the, the share of uh, intermediate uh, goods coming from China uh, is not low, yeah. It's it's a part of um, supplies and uh, possible disruptions uh, in in those supply chains because we right now we have supply chains all over the world and and possible disruptions from such a significant supplier like China is uh, would would hurt uh, especially those countries which are uh, on the upper side of uh, of this chart. Uh, of course, it's also <coughs> sorry. Of course, it's also <clears throat> very important to take a look <clears throat> what sectors uh, could be impacted. So, <clears throat> uh, in terms of, of sectors, uh, in terms of <clears throat> the exposition for intermediate goods coming from China, uh, well, uh, first of all, I put on this chart uh, four biggest economies in Central and Eastern Europe, so Russia, Poland, Romania and Czech Republic. Uh, and as you can see, the <clears throat> biggest impact uh, would be uh, in terms of uh, imports of computers and electronic as well and textiles and clothing. Also in uh, non-metallic -metal minerals and wood that specially applies to Russia. Uh, and uh, I think that when we, when we take a look at, at the sectorial uh, split uh, the one the ICT sector so electronics and computers would suffer the most if we uh, have the supply shock uh, from China uh, because of of some uh, difficulties in keeping the production uh, on the current level and even right now uh, we are in a, in the middle of March we see that uh, Chinese companies report that they are not fully back at the at the production capacities. Uh, I think the latest figure I've seen uh, last week was about 60-70% uh, of their production capacities. Uh, so still, still there's a room to, to, to improve it to, to 100% and uh, we still believe it, it will be quite gradual. Uh, so uh, as I said, uh, computers, electronics and textile and clothing. Uh, less important, for example, in Romania, which uh, uh, is supplied uh, quite strongly by domestic uh, need, by, by domestic resources. Uh, also, if we compare it to the domestic side, because there are the shirt of China in, in all uh, intermediate good imports, so that, that also could be valid, for example, for Poland, where there are supplies also coming from, from the internal part. Uh, and if we go further to, <clears throat> to other countries, <coughs> uh, sorry, if we go further to and other countries uh, in our region like Austria, Bulgaria, Hungary and uh, Lithuania, we see 
roughly similar structure that computers and electronic and textile clocking could be impacted uh, the most. Of course, here in those economies, I use the same scale, so up to 60% uh, dependence on China in those economies is uh, lower in terms, of course, if in terms of course supplies of intermediate uh, goods. Uh, and uh, well, <clears throat> then. Uh, I said that um, uh, situation is a little bit improving in terms of um, of China, uh, that companies are coming back to work, that uh, production plants uh, are, are coming back to work. It's, it's not uh, perfect because we, we still, still there's still some room to improve these, these capacities. Uh, but here I would like also to share with you the, the latest chart with the Baltic Exchange Dry, dry Index. Uh, because it's a quite good measure to follow uh, what's happening uh, with global trade. Uh, so, so basically, uh, what's that? This Baltic, the Baltic Exchange Dry Index. Uh, it is a price index for maritime freight, uh, but it is only for dry bulk. So, like cereals, like metals. Uh, so, it's it's uh, cannot be uh, just a typical reference to global trade, but nevertheless, it's a quite, I think, good proxy to that. Uh, and the main line is that Navy line, so Baltic Exchange Dry Index BDI. Uh, we can see that uh, it started to rebound. It started to rebound after this uh, period of, um, of, of withholding production due to uh, New Year vacation in China, due to the cases of COVID-19. Uh, but its increase is quite slight, uh, and of course, it is also could be because th those are, as I mentioned, this is a price index, so it could be also impacted by the level of prices, by oil prices, and so on. Uh, and uh, here, going further, digging further into this index, uh, other lines you can see those different colors are components of this BDI index. And here, the Supramax index; uh, those are cargos between fifty thousand. Uh, to 60,000 tons, so so the smallest, well, the, the, the well, one of the smallest in terms of maritime transport. The Panama index, those are cargos between 65,000 to 80,000 tons, so so the medium one. And then we have Cape, si Cape size index, uh, the biggest one with cargos above 120,000 tons. And this ca Cape size index, so the biggest one, as you can see, it is not, it has not shown so far an improvement. Uh, I think it's also connected with China that it's not came back to uh, its full um, uh, production capacities. And I think that's, uh, that's another confirmation that we should have in mind that a supply shock may be, uh, it, this, it is not as a huge concern as it was like, uh, for example, uh, at the end of February, but we still have to, to monitor uh, such a risk. Uh, and then, uh, then I would like <clears throat> also to, to share with you our views on the automotive sector, because as, as you've seen, as I showed you, uh, car sales in China dropped significantly by 80% in February. China is a significant market for car producers globally. Also in our region, we have uh, the Czech Skoda or Škoda, depending how you pronounce it in your countries. Uh, of course, it's in a Volkswagen group, uh, uh, but uh, the main single market uh, for, for Czech Skoda brand is China. Uh, 30, nearly 30% 30 of all uh, vehicles were sold uh, in 2019 in China. Uh, so if we have uh, such a huge contraction of, of uh, demand for, for the automotive production in China, then it is, of course, uh, going to affect uh, Germany, Central and Eastern Europe, many car producers, uh, and, and I, I would say the automotive sector worldwide. Uh, and actually, we've already seen, and uh, last year we, we downgraded uh, several times uh, the automotive sector in many countries because we've seen that uh, the sector is the, the, is the one that remains to be risky with uh, these uh, new emission standards, uh, with delayed adoptions to, to those new emission standards. Uh, with uh, poorer performance, financial performance. So this is what you can see on this slide. So higher uh, debt ratios, uh, lower margins. Uh, then we have also uh, needs for, for very costly investments, changing consumer behavior uh, and so on and so on. So uh, for the automotive sector, <clears throat> uh, this is a 
quite this could be quite hard uh, hit if we have uh, more to that uh, COVID-19. Um, here I think it's also a good transition to to another channel that we can have from uh, from COVID-19 for Central and Eastern Europe. <clears throat> so that's what will happen and what is happening right now uh, with Western Europe. So uh, the main trading destination for most Central and Eastern European countries. Uh, mostly Germany, which is a very export-oriented economy, uh, and uh, here the automotive sector, but also other sectors depend uh, strongly on, on uh, the performance of global trade and the global demand. Uh, <clears throat> here, of course, uh, it's also worth to, to say about Italy. Well, in, in Italy, as you know, the, that country became uh, I would say a very significant uh, center, unfortunately, the, the negative hero of, of COVID-19 in Europe uh, with uh, significant increases of cases uh, and, and uh, very high increase uh, since, since it was reported uh, first and then very <clears throat> drastic measures introduced uh, by, by the government uh, there. Uh, and right now, today, we have uh, the situation that still the biggest number of COVID-19 cases uh, is, is attributed to China, 81,000. But uh, on the second place, we have Italy, unfortunately, 31,000 of, of cases with, uh, unfortunately, uh, higher death, death ratios that, that uh, they were, they are in China. Uh, and then uh, we have also talking about uh, COVID-19 cases statistics. We have Iran with 16,000 uh, cases, and then we have European countries like Spain and Germany, France. Those countries report um, a quite high number of cases, and that's, as I said, another channel of contagion that could be, that is not could, but is uh, very dangerous for Central and Eastern Europe because. Uh, exports uh, de depend on, on uh, various countries uh, and on demand from Western Europe, especially those small economies, smaller economies in Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, they share the equivalent of exports of goods and services to GDP ratio are often above 80 or even 90 percent uh, of the GDP. So, so this uh, dependence of that's what's happening uh, on external markets is, is very significant. And well, <clears throat> what we have in, in Italy. Uh, right now when we take a look at, at the Italian economy and possible uh, impact because uh, that, that's uh, right now it's the, the biggest tricky point because so far we do not have hard data uh, from from many economies I, I uh, shared with you Chinese data but uh, as I said um, the highest number of cases uh, was was in February and, and we had already some February data whereas in, in Europe in the US uh, this peak, according to us, will be in April, so still we are ahead of the peak of cases uh, of COVID-19 in Europe and, uh, and the US. Uh, so, so we cannot see in hard data this impact, we can only estimate uh, that, that possible impact. Uh, so in terms of Italy, as you can see, it's, it's very service-oriented economy and right now with a lockdown of, uh, of um, I would say of the economy and, and with, with decreased, uh, strongly decreased shopping by, by people and, and using services, it's, it will be a hard hit for, for the Italian economy. As you can see also compared to other countries, uh, the share of services in gross value added uh, is, uh, share of export services gross value added in GDP is much higher than, uh, than in other, for example, countries like France or, or Germany. Uh, and uh, here, uh, well, it, it's difficult um, to, to uh, give estimations of, of GDP growth that, that uh, could be expected here. Uh, in terms of uh, the European economy, the recently the European Commission delivered that it expects a recession of 1% uh, in Europe, uh, whereas previously it, uh, its estimation was plus 1.4% growth. Uh, but nevertheless, the European Commission also repeated that uh, they wouldn't like to, to give any strict estimation because they wait till May uh, when there will be uh, another forecast report coming from the European Commission. And then some, some more precise figures figure could, be, could be presented because right now, as I said, similar to us, uh, they, they, I think they experienced the same, so lack of hard data uh, that, that, could, uh, that we could have some calculations of GDP growth forecast. But nevertheless, let me share with you 
um, some some our initial thoughts, at least initial thoughts in terms of uh, GDP growth forecast. So uh, in terms of Italy, well, first of all, when we had we've seen the first impact of that, <clears throat> we we believe that uh, it will be recession. It will be recession, uh, quite slight one. But then with the lockdown of of the activity. Uh, our our recent forecast is uh, minus 2.4 percent, uh, so so quite a st strong recession, I would say. Uh, but nevertheless, I wouldn't like to provide it as our official figure because uh, there there are so many developments and there will be so many developments that this forecast is likely to change uh, probably uh, each week or even sometimes even uh, each day, depending on, on particular activities. Uh, and here, well, in, in terms of finishing this picture uh, of Italy, we, we have uh, some several sectors that are in fragile position. We already before seen that uh, for sectors uh, like metals, services, transports, and agri-food, agri uh, we, we had a high debt, net debt ratio. So right now, uh, for them, it will be really hard to survive. So we also expect uh, increased uh, number of, of insolvencies coming uh, from, from particularly from those sectors in Italy. Uh, then, of course, uh, Italy is, is not only the export market uh, that, that you could consider that, okay, there's a lockdown of economic activity and it will be difficult, very difficult to operate there. But also, it's it's also a source of imports. Uh, similar to that, what I showed you on China here on the left-hand side, you have a, a, a share of uh, Italian intermediate goods uh, in all intermediate uh, goods imports in particular countries. Uh, so those trade links in our region are, are very intensive in Slovenia and Croatia, but also other countries. Um, uh, Italy is a source for, for other countries. Uh, we can name here uh, various sectors, so like clothing, machinery and equipment, pharma, electrical equipment, agriculture, meat processing, uh, or for example, white goods. Uh, this is also a very <clears throat> significant um, source of supply <clears throat> for companies in, in Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, in, there's also the glass manufacturing that uh, Italian uh, sector uh, supplies, uh, for example, Germany. And in terms of Italy, it's also worth to mention that uh, it's uh, it's a quite big economy, of course, of, of, of the Eurozone. So previously, when we had some problems, some, some difficulties of the Greek economy, we can always say that that okay, it's it's not as big economy. It's, uh, it is likely that it will not. Um, uh, other economies will not suffer very much from that. The, the eurozone will not suffer very much. But here, uh, the Italian economy is very big. It's uh, it's also a significant supplier of, uh, of of goods for important countries in the eurozone, like Germany, France, uh, Spain. Uh, but not only in the eurozone. So you have uh, the U.S. here and the United Kingdom. Those are the main export markets uh, of uh, of Italy. Um, so then, um, uh, let's let's take a look how it looks in terms of trade links with with Italy. Uh, so the most exposed countries are, are uh, roughly the same I showed you in terms of intermediate goods imports uh, chart. Uh, you can see that in terms of external trade, so both export and imports, the biggest trade links are in term, in uh, Slovenia and Croatia. Outside the European Union, we could also mention Albania. Uh, those countries are very dependent on, on that. Uh, what's 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 happening in Italy with, with those trade links, and they are likely to uh, suffer quite uh, soon from that when when the hard data will be released. Uh, but also in other countries, uh, we we see that uh, Italy uh, is uh, for some of them, of course, it's uh, mostly like Balkan and Adriatic countries. It's uh, one of the biggest trading partners on the first rank or on the second rank. But in terms of other countries, maybe this chart, like for Poland, Lithuania, Hungary, looks quite innocent. But uh, nevertheless, though, this is the percentage of GDP. Uh, so, so like in Poland, it exceeds 4%, but uh, Italy is the fifth biggest trading partner for Poland. Uh, so, so indeed, it's likely to, to, to also to uh, several companies, many companies will, will suffer uh, from, from this uh, contraction of the uh, Italian economy. Uh, then, of course, talking about uh, our region and um, and uh, also as a, as a good transition to the next channel of contagion, uh, 
Uh, here I would like to share with you a chart with, with tourism dependence, so what's the percentage of GDP in particular countries. Because in terms of COVID-19, we see significant impact coming, of course, it's quite obvious for, for the tourism sector, uh, for airlines, uh, for transports. Uh, right now we've already seen that, that people are reluctant to travel, more to that there are uh, official travel bans uh, in many countries. Uh, also, with with airlines suspending uh, servicing the, the connections to, to to particular countries, to I, I think it's it could be said it's it's worldwide trend. Uh, and here again, countries Balkan countries like Croatia and Slovenia are very dependent uh, on tourism uh, in our region. Also, Estonia and Austria, the the percentage share of tourism in in, uh, in their GDP uh, is quite high. Uh, and those countries are likely to suffer from a lower number of tourists, especially if COVID-19 cases uh, uh, last longer, if coronavirus uh, lasts longer than expected. So if uh, the peak indeed is in April, but it, it could be done, it's um, not overdone, that we have even, uh, there, there will be closer to summer, there will be still a threat of, of that then it will be really harmful for, for Adriatic countries, especially Adriatic countries in, in our uh, region. <clears throat> As I said, I think it's a good transition also to, uh, to another channel of contagion. And this channel, the, the last channel of contagion, I think it's, uh, well, I would say the most important one. So uh, that's, uh, the, uh, that's, that's what will happen in our countries. Uh, as you know, in a number of uh, Central and Eastern European countries, we already had uh, some shopping bans, different measures. So like in Poland, we have shopping bans mostly on, uh, in shopping malls, um, but, uh, but people are uh, quite reluctant uh, to do uh, traditional retail. They, they are also moving to online retailing, which is also suffering from some supply issues from, from higher demand. In Hungary, we have the ban which is starting after 3 p.m. Uh, we have uh, lowered uh, social life uh, with, with closed restaurants, uh, with, with closed public places, with a uh, ban on public gatherings. Uh, so uh, that uh, is already really harmful for the uh, sectors, for, for companies dealing with, uh, with organizing events, with tourism, as, as said. Uh, but if we had uh, this lockdown uh, going further or, or staying for longer here in our countries, that's of course we will see um, uh, some some very significant effects, uh, I would say, for almost all sectors. Uh, so then it will suffer the retail sector, uh, then also other sectors because it would not supply the retail sector, the demand would be uh, lower. So if we have the demand shock, not only what we see right now, so maritime transport, general transport, airlines, tourism. Um, as I said, the automotive sector, but also uh, retail, construction, chemical sector, electronics, all of them will, will suffer. Uh, and uh, talking more, because I think uh, it should be also uh, concluded with uh, that's what's, uh, what's, what could be also from supply shock. So other sectors that, that could suffer. Uh, if we have supply shock from China, that's obviously, as I said, electronics, textiles and automotive. But also we can have uh, this supply shock from, from Italy, which here again, the textile clothing sector, but also agri-food and the automotive sector would be heard globally uh, and in Europe and then globally uh, in general. Uh, and then coming uh, to a, uh, the end of this presentation, sorry, because I can see that I'm behind the schedule, but I think that, that the topic is, is uh, quite interesting. So, so I, I, I hope uh, all those information are, uh, is, is interesting uh, to you. Uh, we had another impact for coming from COVID-19 for, for commodities uh, market. Uh, so we had this drop, significant drop of oil prices. Of course, it's not related only to uh, slower demand uh, because of COVID-19 uh, of global slowdown, or maybe we can soon say global recession. Um, uh, but also from the uh, breakup of, of the OPEC plus countries deal, uh, 
uh, with with uh, really uh, had um, with no conclusions, especially with from uh, between Saudi Arabia and Russia, and that made uh, the oil prices drop to to the levels roughly we've seen. Uh, at the beginning of 2016, when when uh, we, we had these uh, well very low oil prices, today uh, the Brent oil barrel is priced at 28 dollars, so very low level. <clears throat> and here we expect, in terms of commodity prices, including oil, that it they will remain at that low level because we have low demand. Uh, we have uh, quite, um, I would say. Uh, increased supply that that would like to be delivered to the markets right now uh, with with many export commodities but when there's no demand uh, well no maybe not no demand but but much lower demand of course that affects prices uh, and uh, i think that also is relevant to other commodities um, uh, exporters and and other commodity markets also agri food production when we have rather lower demand and prices are, are going to be low. Previously, we expect that at least soybean production uh, will increase in, in the US uh, and it will also impact prices positively. I mean, uh, prices going up. Uh, but, well, right now, with, with increasing cases in the US, we, we also think that this demand also for the agro-food production uh, will, will not be as, as high as it could be. Uh, okay, so I think uh, those are um, uh, th those are main conclusions. Uh, before we go to Q and A session, I think it's also worth to uh, mention the last thing here. So, what what could be done? Uh, we've seen already that, uh, for example, central banks uh, started to be very active to to support the economy. So we had these big players uh, like the U.S. Fed, which uh, first decreased uh, 50 interest rates by 50 basis points, then by 100 basis points. Uh, and uh, well, it's a significant decrease, especially it was done uh, before the regular meeting. We had many other central banks also um, uh, doing some actions, European Central Bank, uh, with, with uh, extending its unconventional measures with a probable decrease of interest rates uh, in, in next month, in probably in June, but, but we will see maybe, maybe earlier. Uh, we also see in uh, many, many, really many central banks, uh, like in Latin America, Chile, uh, we had closer to us in England, in our region, uh, one of the first started that started was was the one in Serbia. We had in the Czech Republic also um, uh, adopting the monetary policy to to uh, current uh, situation. Uh, recently, we have it also in Poland. Not only decreasing interest rates, but starting for the first time in the history the quantitative easing uh, program uh, by the Polish central bank. So that's what actually we could not uh, think previously because. Uh, the latest revision of interest rates in Poland was in March 2015. Uh, and now, uh, although it was said that um, the central bank is quite reluctant to, to change interest rates, uh, and it was likely they will uh, remain at the current and the previous level uh, till at least 2021. But right now, they were very fast in, in delivering uh, their decisions. So, likely. Uh, that there we could see also some some other measures coming from central banks. It's needed. It's needed on the global scale. Uh, although uh, DAPs are here, if it is, uh, it will really help uh, because if uh, we have uh, some problems, like especially for uh, small and medium uh, companies, we are with lower demand. Uh, they are likely to. Uh, to, to, to lower uh, employment uh, and for them even if interest rates are lower it's, it's not a game changer here so that's uh, why um, we need further measures also from uh, uh, central banks partly already already implemented we need also some fiscal stimulation here also by many many economies um, ideas like uh, uh, using, for example, or withholding taxes, withholding social contributions. Uh, there are various ideas with, uh, with postponing uh, loan repayments. Uh, I think we will hear more and more uh, ideas like that. And <clears throat> those different channels of support are needed right now. <coughs> Sorry, because the COVID-19 indeed uh, became a significant threat for, for economies. And the big question mark is that how long 
<clears throat> it will last uh, and and what what what's what, what will be uh, next uh, next steps in terms of of increase of covid-19 cases uh, and here i uh, as i said i for example shared with you some uh, our initial thoughts on gdp growth forecast for italy uh, for central and eastern european countries and i would say for for all economies it's very hard to to update forecast right now when we don't have hard data when we cannot say where this uh, covid-19 uh, impact uh, is going to to start to diminish our baseline scenario is that uh, in the third quarter of the of um, uh, this year we we should see some improvement or rather uh, end of the third quarter at the beginning of fourth quarter but in the risk scenario we we can have uh, uh, another cases going up and it will not be so easy to uh, to 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 tackle that that issue uh, so in terms of central and eastern european countries previously so like uh, the beginning of january we expected the average gdp growth will reach uh, 3.1% but it's not valid anymore uh, if i would uh, could mention here some figure from from basic assumptions uh, it's likely to be below 2% or even below 1%. It depends on, on these particular contagion effects, particular channels I mentioned to you. Uh, it is likely that uh, some countries in our region could fall into recession. Uh, but as I said, I wouldn't like to name any countries. And uh, even if you ask me during the Q&A session, I wouldn't like to, to provide you with, uh, with the precise figures because uh, it's, it's quite too early uh, to do that. Uh, and I think I, I, would, I would not feel I, I'm, I'm frank with you with not uh, having uh, some at least uh, quasi uh, data to, to, to make uh, those estimations. But nevertheless, looking at our main export markets, I believe we can say right now quite sure that uh, not only in Italy, but also in significant uh, Eurozone economies like uh, Germany, France, uh, we will have a recession. Uh, so, so indeed, I would like to, to finish quite positive, but uh, well, the, the positive thing is that, that the uh, recovery ratio is, is increasing in terms of COVID-19 cases. Uh, and uh, and the positive thing is is that that uh, hopefully our baseline scenario will, will be will be those one that will be executed so uh, with with the peak of cases in Europe in the US in April so so closer to summer months we'll have this uh, COVID-19 uh, effect uh, calming down and and also the economy coming back uh, but this comeback would be not rather the v recovery i told you about uh, in terms of china it would be more like the shape of u letter so so with with uh, gradual coming back to to the activity okay so uh, that's uh, i would say all from uh, my side uh, well not all from my side but all from the side of the presentation right now uh, let's do the q and a session so um, uh, on the right hand side uh, panel of, of this webinar tool you have uh, the questions window uh, so so you can you can ask questions uh, via questions window so please please type questions you have then i will i will of course read it uh, and i will do my best to answer them so i encourage you to to ask questions Hello, Grzegorz. Yes, hello. <clears throat> so, so we have, uh, we have. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, Magda, go ahead. Yeah, uh, Ma yeah, Magda yeah. Will maybe read. I will read the questions because uh, some of our attendees uh, they cannot uh, uh, find uh, the 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 button to 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 just uh, uh, help themselves and uh, read the questions out loud. So maybe I will read the first one. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Magda. Uh, have you already adopted some restriction towards airline sector? Uh, cancellation of frozen the credit limits. Uh, 
Uh, well, actually, we, we are we are monitoring the risk uh, globally um, uh, and and what what sectors are impact were are impacted. As as I mentioned, uh, airlines sector is, is strongly impacted. Uh, in in our in our region, it's uh, it could be not as significant as, for example, in in Western Europe, but indeed we have some uh, airlines here. Uh, in terms of of limits, uh, actually, I'm I'm not the right person to to uh, to speak about it. If uh, that question comes from our client, I think the the most appropriate person is is your contact at Cofas. Uh, if you if you can contact, uh, he or she will will give you more more feedback. Nevertheless, I will not hide here that that we will be more pessimistic in terms, especially on those sectors which. Already suffered from uh, from decreased demand, uh, and and the airlines is, is significant, of course, uh, hit by that. Okay, I will read another one. Uh, what is your opinion regarding potential influence on transport in industry of this pandemic? Well, I think it's uh, it it will be huge. Yeah, first of all, in terms of uh, passenger transport, so we mentioned uh, already that uh, airline transports, passenger transports. Uh, but also cargos, although in, in those countries when we have uh, closed borders, uh, we, we have in many of them uh, uh, possibility to, to, to transfer the cargos. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, we have uh, like now in, in Central Eastern Europe, we, we have uh, huge uh, queues, huge lines at, at uh, borders. So uh, it seems that borders came back, although we are in the Schengen area. Uh, so, well, I would say that one of the reason is uh, is indeed uh, because of those uh, measures that were implemented by the governments. But to uh, be frank with you, um, those measures are needed. Yeah, that, that's also our view uh, because uh, the, the most uh, the, the bigger impact could be from from that if we do not have those quarantine measures and these quite drastic measures. Uh, for also for the economy and then for the health of the society for for the death ratios, uh, so so it's it's understandable that that uh, many countries introduce them. But at the same time, it's a, it's a huge impact for the economy and the transport sector is the one which is the first to to suffer from that. So indeed, we also expect uh, increasing insolvencies uh, from from the transport sector, uh, and which is also impacted by not only by the local. Uh, issues, but from the global issues, because as I said, uh, disruptions of supply chains are, are very significant. Uh, or and we hopefully the, the supply shock from China we will will not be as as huge as as it could be when when we had uh, February. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, all of, we are, have many many companies that are involved in supply chains, so they can suffer from both demand shock and then the supply shock as well. Okay, the next one, how do you see risk uh, appetite in the next one and a half month? Uh, if, uh, well, um, if that, that's a question on, on uh, our risk appetite, on our limits, I would say as previously that, uh, that here it's, it's uh, concluding that what I said, it's up to decision of, of our underwriters, how they will uh, look like. If uh, that's on the risk appetite on, uh, Capital markets, uh, which because I, I sorry I, I forgot to, to mention that I I, I mentioned uh, the oil market, but we also have a huge uh, drops uh, in in the stock exchange market. Uh, well, I think that uh, well, when we still have this huge uncertainty, um, the risk appetite uh, on, on capital markets will, will be lower. Of course, that there will be partly investors, uh, especially especially those speculative investors, uh, some some funds uh, that would like to uh, to jump into the market to 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 buy stocks shares at uh, at low prices uh, with um, they hopes to to benefit strongly benefit when when it rebounds. Uh, but the question is that where, when, where is this bottom bottom point? Uh, and uh, well, uh, I think it depends on a particular date. It depends on on news we will have uh, with with uh, another COVID cases with another measure. So I, I wouldn't like to say that the bottom of of the stock market has been reached. Do you see any possible liquidity squeeze on the market? Companies right now are still paying on new dates. Could you change in could change in one two months when no revenue 
revenues are recorded, but fixed costs remain? Yes, this <clears throat> liquidity squeeze is, is a, well, that's a very good question. Um, uh, as, as it was mentioned in this question, companies right now are uh, still paying on due dates, but but the question is that what, what, what will be then? Uh, we have uh, recently done the Poland payment survey and, and we've seen that although uh, the payment delays decreased, it decreased uh, very slightly because by three days still in Poland we have average payment delays uh, of uh, nearly two months and that was before the COVID-19 uh, issue. Uh, so, well, um, uh, right now I think that companies probably this this situation on the uh, microeconomic side uh, could come with some delay although uh, we, when we have a, a contraction of the economic contraction of trade uh, it as i said for example the transport sector is is going to suffer that as a, as a first uh, one of the first ones uh, we we can say that uh, the payment liquidity could worsen but indeed i think that uh, this uh, time scope uh, could be like one or two months, uh, and in terms of insolvencies, um, one one of, were our baseline scenario that it is likely we we could have um, insolvencies, especially increasing uh, in six uh, to nine months company insolvencies. Uh, but as I said, still again huge uncertainty, which uh, mostly is because of that. What, what will happen next? What are the next? And developments and and when when will be when will be this point that we will say that okay the economy starts to improve. And the risk action expect a reduction of limits. Uh, reduction of limits. Could, could you make that repeat because I didn't catch the yeah. whole question. And the risk <clears throat> action expect reduction of limits. Well, that, that, that's the same uh, I, I said previously. So uh, unfortunately, we will not hide that that probably some actions uh, would be needed here. Uh, if we if we um, take a look what's happening in the economy, if we take a look, for example, in Italy, uh, which which we already see contractions in a number of sectors, as I said, uh, which already um, weak financial results uh, in a number of sectors, then I think and um, unfortunately our our um, uh, policy and, and our attitude to, to limits uh, could be adopted but here uh, i'm not able at this stage to, to to give you any any particular figures or something like this okay i i see that we have also uh, one um, one one question uh, uh, with uh, or other comment regarding the audio. Uh, so sorry if, and thank you for because I have that's our wishes for my my health. Indeed, I, I think it's I hope it's not COVID nineteen, but but indeed as probably as lots of you uh, stay stay at home. I also work from home, so so I, I I'm I'm very disciplined with that not to go out probably. Uh, I, I maybe from my kids I, I I got some some kind of call so thank you for those wishes for for health. Uh, but but indeed sorry for this audio I'm aware that, that I was coughing during this webinar but nevertheless I hope you you it was understandable uh, to you uh, that that you that you uh, found it interesting. We also have a question uh, on. Um, on the presentation uh, so uh, yes it's as i said it's in the handout section of, of this tool you can download it uh, but uh, i will keep in mind because i have who, who asked this question about the presentation so i will share it if, if you uh, if you prefer to to be sent it by email of course i, I will send the presentation uh, in the email uh, we are we are it's almost one hour it's it was supposed to to uh, last half an hour maybe i would just uh, pick some some uh, one or two questions more so i can see there's a question what do you expect about the uh, unemployment in eastern europe well another very good question because uh, we we have had uh, very good times in in terms of the labor markets i mean here from the perspective of households with uh, decreasing unemployment rates in last years with growing wages that's why we can say that the household consumption was a significant growth driver uh, of economies in uh, in central and eastern europe well right now uh, especially the middle uh, small and middle companies um, and medium companies uh, are likely to decrease employment 
I think that uh, unemployment rates will be going up uh, and here of course some support of government is needed because if we have uh, no demand if company would not have turnover for them they could not just keep employment at the current level uh, so I, I can say that this second round effects uh, could be could be quite um, quite significant for our economies uh, so it's likely that in terms of unemployment rates, uh, we reached already the bottom. So, so we should expect that uh, indeed uh, in, in next months uh, the unemployment rate will be increasing, increasing whereas um, uh, growth of wages will not be as dynamic uh, as uh, as it was uh, previously. Because in a number of countries we have <clears throat> we have a significant uh, growth of, of wages. Uh, okay, uh, so uh, so I think uh, thank you thank you for for all your questions. Uh, thank you for your attendance. We we see that uh, it gathers lots of attention. So uh, I hope you you found it interesting. Uh, we will also have another webinars if there are significant uh, changes or even not significant but changes related to to the economic update in terms of COVID nineteen. We are likely to repeat uh, those uh, similar a similar webinar with with new developments with our with updated charts with our new views so so i hope you will also join uh, our next webinars uh, in the future uh, so thank you thank you once again for your attendance uh, stay healthy and uh, enjoy the, the rest of your day uh, thanks a lot and bye bye